Clap your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because praise destroys the work of the enemy. The word says it steals the avenger. Satan has to freeze when the praise is going on. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles and stand with me. As we turn to a scripture that we have become most familiar with during our Bible study. To Deuteronomy chapter 6. Beginning at verse 1. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come before your presence, to commune with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hear, O Israel. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, This morning, I want to talk to you about loving God with everything you've got. Loving God with everything you've got. As I said in Bible study, we've been looking at this verse, and it has become very uh, familiar to us here at Ecclesia, and we've been uh, repeating it and, and, and just enjoying it. But I wanted you to become familiar with it and understand the depth of it. Because you see, this uh, chapter, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, is called the Shema. The Shema, the, that word means to listen, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this verse is recited every morning and every evening in the homes of observant Jews. This is uh, uh, so much a part of the life of um, the, 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 the people of God that when the Holocaust um, had passed, there was a rabbi who went into Europe to find children who had been sent there 
in order for them to survive. And there was no way for him to know whether or not they were Jewish children. They, they all looked like children, like, you know, uh, they were in Germany. They, they looked like all of the other German children. But what he did when he went into an orphanage was because this is a song and they teach it to their children as soon as they can talk. Every Jewish child, as soon as they can talk, is taught to recite the Shema in the morning and in the evening. So what he did was when he went into the orphanages, he would begin to sing the song and see the eyes of the Jewish children light up because they remembered it from the time that, that, that they were born until they were able to talk and recite it themselves. And so we have to understand that this is just not a Bible verse, but it is actually a constitution. It is a statement of loyalty and covenant to God. And it has such an impact in the Jewish community. If we go to Mark, the 12th chapter, we are reminded that the Shema was also the, cent the, the, the center of Jesus' faith. Because remember, and, and, and different um, gospel writers have it uh, differently. Some say that it was a scribe. Some uh, say that it was a lawyer. But a, 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 a young lawyer or a scribe came to Jesus and asked him, what is the, the great essence of, of, of the law. What principle in, encompasses all of God's instruction? What is the heart of God's will? And let's, let's look at, um, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, Perceiving that he had answered them well, Jesus had answered them well, he asked Jesus, what is the first commandment of all? What, what, what is the, the greatest commandment? If, if I only had an opportunity to hold dear one commandment, to, to walk out one commandment, to keep one commandment, what should it be? And Jesus recites the Shema, S-H-E-M-A. Doesn't your Bible says the first of all the commandments is, or whatever your translation is, it may be a little different, but it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And we'll talk about why in this particular passage of scripture, there are four things, but in the other gospels, there are three things. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So what God is saying to his people is, if you love me with everything that you've got, and you love your neighbor as a reflection of your love for me. You don't have to worry about all the other little teeny things. But how many of us have to admit that we have not perfected the art of love yet? And the thing that we have to know is that until we are practicing love, we're not being obedient to God. I know we want to sing, we want to dance, we want to teach, we want to preach, we want to serve, we, we want to take off our makeup and our earrings, and uh, we want to wear ties and shirts and think that all of this is giving us uh, approval in the sight of God. But if you're not loving, you're not obeying. Now, I want to break this down for you today. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the Hebrew language is word poor. There are only about 8,000 words in the language as opposed to 400,000 in English. 
However, and because of that, each of those 8,000 words is packed and jammed with different meanings. That's one of the frustrations of learning a language is that one word can mean so many things. One word actually can be a sentence, okay? And so it's important when we look at this and, and when we study the word of God from the, the Hebrew, the Jewish perspective, that we understand that it's not always what it looks like. And I, I, th- I, I, I just feel an, an unction in my spirit uh, uh, by, the, by the spirit of God to share with you that when we stand and we say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy, thy mind, and thy soul, and all thy strength. That we're really saying more than a mouthful. Amen? Amen. So I hope that you all don't get sleepy and bored with me today. I want to take my time and break this thing down so that it will bring new meaning and new life to you. Uh, one of the examples of words having multiple meanings is the word remember. So, when when we say God remembers him, what do we think as Westerners and as Americans? Americans tend to be more intellectually oriented, whereas the the people of the Bible were action-oriented. So, when we say, when we read in the word of God, in the Hebrew in particular, God, that God remembered or he remembered someone, what we're saying is not only that they came to mind, but that God took action on their behalf. You you, you got me? He took action. If I remember you, I'm going to take action on your behalf. Another word is no. I know you. We throw that, we throw that around a lot. I know him. I know her. It means not just to have met or to be acquainted, but it means to care. It means to be in relationship with. It means to have intimacy with. Okay? Okay. So when we look at thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, We're looking at something. First of all, he says, hear, O Israel. And that word for hear is Shema. Shema. That's that's the same word, S-H-E-M-A, that is used to title the, the, the commandment. Okay? Shema, hear. Okay? Hear, in, in Hebrew, means not to recognize the sound or receive the sound, but here means to obey. It means to do, to take heed and respond to what you're hearing. When, 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 when David says the Lord heard me. He's not just saying my voice came up into the ears of God. He's saying the Lord acted on my behalf. Isn't that some good stuff? So now when you're reading the Psalms and David said that he heard my cry, then you now know, and God did something about the cry. So God is saying, hear old Israel. He's saying, Israel, I want you to listen and to take heed and respond with action. So when we asked our children, did you hear me? I'm not asking you, did you hear me? I'm asking you what's wrong with you that you're not doing what I told you to do. Hallelujah. I I, I think I'm going to have to start um, using that group conference call where I just just, just call you all up at 4 o'clock in the morning and preach it because I can't wait till I get to church. 
Amen. <laughs> Leave the message on your voicemail or something. I have been waiting all night long to come and to give you this. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen, amen. They say that what you are at home is what you, who you really are. So praise the Lord, amen. Okay, so he, he says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Now, before I go into that, I, I want to bring, I want you to pay attention to something. In, and when we look at um, the Old Testament, and we look even in the New Testament, and we look at the Jewish community, which we are, we came out of, and we are now grafted into, amen, and entitled to all of the privileges and all of the promises and the covenant that God made with Abraham. Notice that they see worship and serving God as a corporate thing. We see it as a personal relationship. We say, I love you, Lord, and I live my voice. They say, we. Jesus, keep me near the cross. They say, us. Pay attention to that. See, see the transition that has taken the further that we got away from the Eastern culture, the, the further we've gotten away from the heart of the faith. And now everybody's talking about what God is speaking to them and what God is doing in their life and what God is saying to them. Whereas in Israel, it's us, we as a people, we as a nation. When the prophets came up in Israel, they talked about the national situations. Our prophets talk about our car, our job, our new. Okay, but here, O Israel, the Lord who? Our God, the Lord is one. And that word one is a card. And it, 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 it means that see when god called abraham out of uh, uh uh mesopotamia out of ur he called him out of paganism he called him out of a people who believed that everything was a different god the sun God, the, the water God, the rain God, the, the moon God, the, uh, the grass God, amen. The, you know, er, everything was a different God. And God told, uh, uh, called Abraham to himself and revealed himself as the God who is one. I'm in control of it all. Doesn't New Testament scripture tell us that we've got one spirit but different administrations? Amen. So here now, God is telling Moses to declare to the people that the Lord is your God and he is one. He is one God. But that word, remember, meaning more than one thing doesn't just mean that there's only one God in terms of all of the various deities that the other nations were worshiping. But it, it also means that he is the only. You all understand what I'm saying? That he alone is God. Because one also means alone. Hallelujah. Is this good to you all or am I just tripping? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I'm saying now, Minister Anthony, that I realize that God is sovereign. That God is God all by himself. He doesn't consult anybody. He doesn't report to anybody. He doesn't need anybody. He didn't come from anybody. He's not going to anybody. He is alone, my God. He's all sufficient. Hallelujah. I don't need to bring in anything else. 
I can go straight to my God who is God alone and get everything that I need. Paul said, it's my God that shall supply all of my need. He's El Shaddai. He's the all-sufficient one. He's the fully breasted one. What's better for you than breast milk? All right. Okay. Y'all, you all didn't like that because we want to see God as a male. But we have to understand that femininity is a part of God's character. Hallelujah. And he's not bisexual. He is. His name means is, was, and shall be. So God is one. He, he is, 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 is the only God and he is God alone. Hear Shema. Listen and take heed. Respond to what it is that I'm telling you, O Israel. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And because he is one, because he's our God, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's what Jesus said. The Shema, originally where he took it from, in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, says that you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, And with all of your strength. How how do I live this thing? What should my love for God look like in my life? What should my love for God look like? Should, should, Should it be a prayer scarf on my head? Should it be no earrings? Amen. What, what should my, my love for God look like? The first thing we have to realize is that love for God is more than a feeling. That's what have people messed up, even in their marriages. Because once the thrill is gone, when the, when the love moves from infatuation to maturity... People begin to feel sometimes something's wrong with this. I, I'm supposed to have a thrill. I'm supposed to get goosebumps. Uh, 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 the hair is supposed to rise up on the back of my neck and I don't have that anymore. See, we have thrill junkies. We have thrill junkies. Amen. Amen. Folks who, who think that love is feeling, that it's chemistry. And if something happens to destroy the chemistry, then there's something wrong with the relationship. And we're the same way sometimes with God. Because once we get settled and begin to grow and mature, and we don't get excited anymore to preach it and spinning around and performing and you know, have a screaming and dancing and shouting, then we say there's something wrong with that church. That preacher isn't touching me right. Amen? Like I'm not getting the thrill. And so they pack their little bags and suitcases and go to the next church and let that pastor entertain them and make them feel good and shout and dance and run them down the house and when that wears off then they pack up their little toys and their marbles and and take it to the next church tell somebody it's more than a feeling love is more than a feeling Love will make you do what you are supposed to do when you don't feel like it. I'm only doing, you don't deserve it, but I'm doing this because I love you. 
I don't want to just dog you out completely. There's a little little flicker going on down here because I really could do you, you know. Isn't that what God does for us? I could really do you, you know. But I love you. So even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to open that door for you. Even though you're acting like a fool, I'm going to bless you. Even though you're not doing what I tell you to do, I'm not going to put a curse on you. Love will make you do what you're supposed to do, even though the person doesn't deserve it. Because love wants the ultimate best for the object of the love. Even if it means I have to sacrifice. Love isn't moved by emotion. Love isn't moved by feeling. Married folks, do you realize that there is somebody else out there that can ring your bells, your chimes, beat your Tiffany drums, blow your trumpet, and everything? So what are you going to do every time you run into somebody you have chemistry with? Kick your mate to the curb and go running off because you feel it? You, 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 know what? you look, I see, I can talk. This is my sweetie baby right here. I, I can talk to him. He knows what I'm talking about. Don't you know what I'm talking about? You haven't ever walked in a room and just felt an electromagnetism with somebody and just, just had to sit out and go, go somewhere and fan. Lord Jesus, help me, please. Amen. It's got to be more than a feeling. You know, ladies, we've been talking about that. Sometimes you have to let that feeling go and get with Elma Fudd. You know you can trust Elma. Elma's going to go to the store and come back. Praise the Lord. Elma's going to get that check, sign it over, and put it in the bank. But when you're running after a feeling... Just tell three people it's more than a feeling. It's more than a feeling. It's more than a feeling. So how, 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 what does love for God look like in my life? Because we have to understand that it is uh, God's love and our demonstration of God's love that distinguishes the difference between God's people and the world. It's your love that distinguishes you from the world. It's not because we don't mess up. It's not because everything in our life is in order. Anybody else got a jacked up, some jacked up issues in their life? Amen. Anybody in here, everything in your life is perfect. Amen. What is perfection? Praise the Lord. I mean, we're blessed. Praise God. But we still have some things that need to look like God in our lives. So the difference between the world and the church is that we, Jesus said, have love for one another. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. What does it look like? Okay, thou shalt love a hava. It's an action. It means to act loving toward or to be loving to. It's what distinguishes us. It means that, you see, when you go into the Old Testament and you begin to study and look at the wars and the kings and how the territory was taken over and on all of those battles in Kings and Chronicles, you will run across situations where the kings made covenant with the enemy kings and the cup in the, in the covenant, they would put in a, a, a clause that they would love that king. They're not saying, oh, I'm going to have a feeling for you, dude. You're going to be my dog. We're going to be boys. 
They're saying, I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect. I'm, I'm going to treat you in a way. That's why it was such a big issue when they found out that our troops had been treating the enemy in a certain way, disrespectful way, uncovering their nakedness, which is against their law and all of That's why uh, President Obama was very careful in how he buried Osama bin Laden. He was loving him. He was showing him respect and honoring his faith and his tradition. He could have left him to rot in the streets. But he had them bring with them an imam, a, a Muslim minister, prepared to handle his body. Some of us don't treat our loved ones with that much respect. What your love look like in my life? There should be something different about me. And the word says that I am to take action toward loving God. We're not obeying God. Until we learn to love. Just tell somebody, I, I have to learn to love for real. You know, so you say, well, how, how can God command me to love him? How, how do I make that connection? How does that come about in my life? Well, the rest of the verse tells you how to love God. Because remember now, love is an action. So in order for me to love God, I have to act a certain way. That's why folks would look at us when we don't do right and say, and you're supposed to be a Christian because the world knows that we're supposed to be acting out our love. That we're supposed to be showing our love for God in our behavior. You just can't get around it. Okay. That's Shut, love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, your love or lava. Your heart is the center of your inner life. There is no word for brain in Hebrew whenever it refers to the mind, it's heart. So thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, meaning with the essence of who you are, with everything that is in your mind and your thoughts. So when I come into the house of God and I sit in his presence, but my mind is on dinner. My mind is on my overtime. My mind is on what I left at home and what I'm going back to. I must love God with my thoughts and with my mind. And his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he does both. So when we talk about loving God, our love should be beyond uh, the, the human love. See, when we're humanly in love, that person consumes us. Our every thought is about them. We can't get anything done. You hear people say, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I'm in love. (laughs) (laughs) 
That's the passion that God wants us to have. Where when we open our eyes, we don't think about what do I need to do today? What am I going to wear today? Who am I going to call? Let me check my email. Let me check and see if anybody texts me in the middle of the night. That's not loving God with all your heart. I, I just wanted us to understand what we're saying and what it truly means. And that's why God's people rise up in the morning after thanking him for returning their souls to their bodies. Because you could get trapped out there in dream world and never come back and don't even know that we've got you stretched out across this altar. (laughs) Unless you happen to fly by in that epoch of time and look down and go... Because your spirit, timeless, ageless, not not confined to space. You know what I believe deja vu is? When you're out there, when you sleep and your body's laying dead, you know how we say, we was dead to the world, you were. You're out there traveling in time and just having a good time in eternity. And you catch up with where you were. Oh, y'all don't believe me. You, you, you ever say, oh, I've done this before. Uh, I know I have never been to Hawaii before, but uh, I've seen this before. <laughs> so you have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with the center of your inner being, with your mind And your thoughts. That really really puts a, a harness on some things. Paul said, I leave my thoughts captive. I, I, I grab hold of my thoughts and bring them in. Because we, we can sit here and our minds can wander. And we're going, praise the Lord, amen. But our mind is over here. God wants us to learn how to grab our thoughts and control them. That's why Paul said, think on these things. Control yourself. Control your thoughts. He didn't say anything about, think about what they did wrong to you. That's not on the list of criteria for our minds activity. He didn't say, think about the doom and gloom that is going to meet you next week. Those things that are lovely and of good report and of virtue. Think on these things. Love the Lord with all of your thoughts. Well, that knocks porn out, doesn't it? (laughs) You all really thought I was going to be deep today, right? Come on now. Uh, uh, Hypothetically, D, let's just say if if you were at the club and sister girl was just kind of sliding down the pole, right? (laughs) You may say, thank you, Jesus, when she drops it like it's hot. But that's not loving the Lord with all your mind and your thoughts, right? Say, I like men. They don't get all, oh, why'd she say that to me? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just trying to give, give everybody an understanding here. You, you can't love God with all your thoughts and all your mind, and your mind is somewhere that's not of God. Okay. Now, he says, and with all of your soul, love God with all of your soul. And that word is nefesh. And I know that we already have established that your soul is your intellect, 
your will, and your emotions. But guess what? Soul means life. And God breathed into the nostrils of man and he became a living soul. Nefesh, it means life, not just your inner being, but are you willing to give your life? There's a story about a rabbi who was a, a, a great teacher. And uh, when the Roman Empire was persecuting Jews, they were torturing him to death publicly. And all of his students were uh, surrounding him and watching. Because remember, we, was it last week we talked about what it really means to say that you're a disciple of a teacher? That technically you live with them? And everywhere they go, you go. And what they, you, you, the teacher eats, they eat. And how the teacher dresses, they dress. And all of that. We, I know we don't see that. But that's what, what, what a, a disciple really means. And so he's being tortured to death. His disciples are around him, and they hear him reciting the Shema. And they cry to him, Master, Rabbi, teacher, how is it that you can still recite the Shema when you're being tortured to death? He said, all my life, I pray for an opportunity to give it. So why should I not be happy that this moment has come? Thou shalt love the Lord with all of your thoughts, your, all of your mind, and love him with your very life. Now, strength. Now in some, in some translations and when we start looking at definitions and what have you, strength and is, is, is a part of mind. Mind is used for strength and, and it's a whole lot of explanations or whatever. So that's why some of the writers put mind in there. Okay? It's replacing or, or connected to strength. Alright? So don't, don't trip over that. Alright? So and with, you shall love the Lord with all your what? And, and strength, strength, strength. The word for, that's used for strength is miyot. Miyot is simply the adverb very. So thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your very. Okay, God, what are you saying? Think about very. And think about what very means. Even in English. God is saying, you should love me with all of your mind, your thoughts, with your very life, with all of your life. Be willing to give me your life and be willing to die for me. And you shall love me with all of your muchness. Your muchness. What is my muchness? All of your increase. All of your resources. You shall love me with everything that you are. Your wealth, your possessions, your family, your money. How can I love you with my money, God? Well, obviously, by sowing into the kingdom. By sharing with those who don't have. And by having financial integrity. Financial honesty. Meaning because I love you with all of my very, I don't cheat on my income tax. Woo. Oh my goodness. 
Oh my goodness. And we thought we were at the end. We looked at the clock. We said we made it through okay. And now here comes the bum. I'm enjoying you all this morning. I hope you're being blessed. Praise the Lord. <laughs> when I love God, because remember now that, that it's an action. So I'm showing God, I love you. You're a God of honesty. You're a God of truth. You're a God of integrity. You're not a man that you should lie. The, 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 the Satan is the, the, the author of every lie. That's the only thing that he produces. So I can't cheat on my income tax. When the lady at the bank gives me an extra $20, I give it back. Oh, my goodness. When I tell folks I'm going to pay them, I've got to pay them. I, I know that we think that, that, that when we start talking about loving God with our very, with our muchness, with our increase, with our wealth, that it only means come and pay tithes and offerings. But no, God is saying, not only do you give me the first fruits, but you handle with integrity what you have left. You honor me. I know that all of us have taken hits, so take this with a grain of salt. But it's an embarrassment when we get on the phone and talk to people. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, yes, God is good, Uh uh-huh, yeah, 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 right, right. Well, I I want this car, Uh, and and they run up your, oh, yeah, yeah, you a deacon, oh, you a minister, you a pastor, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to get you in this car, and then your credit. That casts a a shadow on who? On God. Now, I said, we all have taken hits. However, there are people out here who just don't care. I'll get it, and I'm gone. It's their lifestyle. We should be moving out of that mentality. You all understand what I'm saying, okay? We should be thinking about, well, you know what? I did tell that man I was going to come in every week and give him $50, so that means I can't go to Outback. I can't go to Red Lobster. I've got to take this man, this $50 for whatever it is that I bought. I can't see something else that I want and get that and call him and tell him I'll pay him next week. I've got to stop the mentality of if I promise the big company I'd pay them, I don't have to pay them because it, they, it's not hurting them. They've got all this money. Didn't God say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? And took a coin out of a fish's mouth to give it to his disciples to go and pay their taxes. And I know that, that we're all struggling. Please believe me. But what I'm speaking to is your heart and your mind that we move away from the past and that we honor God, that we love God with everything that we've got. And then look, when you go to Leviticus, the 19th, the 19th chapter, because that's what Jesus did. He incorporated the Shema and then he added what was written in Leviticus 19 and 18, which basically says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor like yourself. And so for years we've heard, and we've always heard, and I've even said it myself. This means that the way you love yourself is the way you should love your neighbor. And that's well and good. But remember, Hebrew is a word poor language. So when we look at the word like, kamoka, kamoka, 
It's saying, I love my neighbor as I love myself. I treat my neighbor as I want to be treated. You all, uh, leaders, you, 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 did you read the little, did you read my, my letter to you at all, first of all? See, I'm, I'm slipping little nuggets in there. If you, you think, oh, I don't need to read this, you're going to miss a whole lot of stuff and be out of step and out of line and everything else, okay? I think that everyone in here can read. All right? Back in the day, it was kind of shaky. You didn't quite know. All right? But I think that everyone in here can read. So at the bottom of that letter to leaders this week, I, I put something like, words are a powerful weapon. Think before you speak or something like that. Words are a powerful weapon. Okay, now, if I'm loving my neighbor like myself, I'm not going to say anything to you. I mean, just anything. I'm going to be mindful of my tone. I'm going to be mindful of when I say it, who I say it in front of, because I wouldn't want you to do that to me. If we just practice that, if we just said, you know what? I'm going to put my mouth in check. I'm going to think before I speak. I'm going to wait until my anger dies down and reassess this thing so that when I speak to this brother, when I speak to this sister, it's going to be in the way that I will want them to approach me. Amen? If you don't want anyone rushing in and getting all up in your face, then guess what? You shouldn't be doing that to anybody else. If you don't want anyone giving you, uh, you know, speak to the hand, then should your hand be in anybody else's face? Here's the other thing. Go to Leviticus 19 and 34. The third thing, okay, love my neighbor as I love myself, which means treat my neighbor as I want to be treated. But here is is the depth of it. Treat my neighbor who is like me. Who is like me. So if I'm aggravated with my neighbor because they keep making mistakes, They're like me. I make mistakes. If I'm aggravated and unforgiving toward my neighbor because they said something that hurt my feelings, they're like me because I've said something to hurt someone else's feelings. If I'm upset with my neighbor because they did not respond in a situation the way I feel that they should have responded, they're like me because I haven't always been what someone wanted me to be. Isn't that incredible? And, and, and look at um, Leviticus 19 and 34. And uh, 33, and if, if a stranger or foreigner dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. For the foreigner who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. God is saying to his people, you don't mistreat people who come from somewhere else because you came from somewhere else. So they're just like you. 
We, we can't look at the other nationalities that are around us and what they taking all the jobs and they doing all this and that. Uh, well, guess what? When we were brought over here, So, for me to say, to love my neighbor as myself, the word is saying, love that person who is an image of you. Love that person who can be compared to you. Who can be similar, who is similar to you. Do you know that most of the time, the things that we don't like about other people is in us. You ever hear two people talking and one person will say, I don't like her because she thinks she's all that. And then that other person looks at them like, okay. <laughs> They're always doing this. They're always, doing, okay. And, and It's like the parent that says, I'm going to whip you for smoking as soon as I finish my cigarette. I'm going to drink this beer and I'm going to beat you for getting drunk last night. I'm going to slap you in the mouth for cussing out your sister, you so-and-so. Look, this is totally off message, and, and, and I'm done. But look at uh, Leviticus 19 and 20, 26, because I know that the, the question has been asked so many times. But just, just so that you, you can see, you shall not eat anything with the blood. And that goes back to a whole little ceremonial thing, blah, blah, blah. You shall... Um, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. And in, in my other Hebrew Bibles, it says, or honor or, or, or look to or count a lucky day. It's, it's talking about luck. So that's, uh, that's the lotto line in my mind. Okay, this translation reads a little different, but it's talking about sorcery um, and luck. And you should not shave around the sides of your beard. You know, they don't shave their, 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 their sideburns or trim the edges of their beards. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo. Any marks on you? Na 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 boo boo ha 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 ha. There it is. So thank you. You can make that make that note. Pass it around to your kids, or don't get any more yourself, because it is in the Bible. Well, that's Old Testament. Jesus hung that up on the cross. Okay. Just so you know, you all know me. I'll give you truth, and you can do whatever you want to do with it. Jews are not buried in a Jewish cemetery if they have a tattoo. It has to come off. It has to come off. It's tribal. It's satanic tribal markings. But it's a pretty little bird. It's a pretty little heart. It's a pretty, you know. That's what the Lord says, not me. So in planning your future. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So in closing, what is the Shema saying? That which for centuries, the Jewish people have recited every morning and every evening. I'm not telling you to recite it every morning and every evening. 
Get that out of your mind. I'm not telling you that because it doesn't mean anything to recite it and not live it. That's legalism. And it will get you nowhere. I just wanted you to know the weight of it and the depth of it. Amen? Amen. But if I can put it in modern day terminology, listen up, Israel. The Lord is your God. He and he alone. You shall love him with every thought, live every hour of every day for him, be willing to, willing to sacrifice your life for him, love him with every penny in your wallet and everything you've got. God bless you.